Welcome to the Coon Hunting University podcast, where we'll discuss all things coon hounds, from competition hunting to pleasure hunting with family and friends. I'm your host, Alan Bridges, and we'll take an in-depth look at our hounds from the wealthy box to the winter circle and all the stops in between. So grab your notebooks and your pencils because class is in session. Conkey's Outdoors knows that keeping up with the latest in hunting technology can be expensive. That's why they are proud to offer amazing financing options from 30 days same as cash to 0% interest for 6, 9, 12, and even 18 months, depending on your credit score and the amount you spend. If you've been eyeballing that new thermal or want to upgrade to the latest in tracking system technology, go find out more on the web at conkeysoutdoors.com or if you're in the Hastings, Florida area, stop by and visit. They'd love to have you. Conkey's Outdoors. Houndsman. Helping houndsman. Today we have a very special guest on. I'm Steve Fussell from Dark Blue Kennels. How long have we known each other? Oh, Lord. Back since the 90s. I, I can't I think you were 17 years old, Alan. That's right. Now, it's been, it's been a long time. <laughs> yes, it has. I, was a, I believe I was a junior in high school. Yeah, I think so. And I was, oh, I graduated in 1994, so probably 1993. Yeah, that sounds like a dash for young then. That's right. That's right. So tell our listeners about Steve Fussell and how you came up with the name Dark Blue Kennels. I always love that, love that kennel name. Well, the kennel name, let me go ahead and get this out of the way. The kennel name came from a female called Ruby. And I had a female, the mother to Ruby, that was Fussel Blue Sheba. She was orchid bred all the way uh, to Suda's orchid, top and bottom. And I hunted with a dog called Bell Creek Blue Buck on the Georgia State. I guided him. And he dominated the cast. He. If you pulled up to the hunt and seen the buck pull up, you knew who was going to win. I had to have some of it. So I bred sheep to, to buck and had this one dark female that nobody wanted. She laid in the corner of the pen and never barked. A year old took her hunt. She stole the tree. She followed them into the tree. She crawled up there and you couldn't hear nothing but her. From that night on, she was a coon dog. She was dark. A month later, she was a night champ. Only been hunted one month, and she was dark. And that's I had always called my kennel. Started off Little Creek Kennel, and then Bustle Blue Kennel. But Dark Blue stuck with me. Alan. That was a name in the nineties that when you saw in the advertisement, you you just had a feeling that that there was going to be something good there. Yeah, yeah. I had. You was asking about me growing up. I grew up in coon hunting with my daddy. Uh, when I was four and five years old, I'd cry during school nights to go with him. He got me started with the coon hunting. Then the, I got into the breeding part when I was about 14. So you've been breeding blue ticks since you were 14. How old are you now, if you don't mind me asking? 62. So that's been a while. Since, since 74. And, and uh. And and I would breed good dog to good dog back then, Alan. I didn't know. And I wasn't studying pedigrees. But back then, most of it was great dog. Yeah. But then when I turned 17, 16, I got registered Blue Tick. He was a grandson to Hammer 3. Well, why did you, why'd you home, pick Blue Ticks as your breed of choice? Daddy had one called Sam, and he was a coon dog. He could take a cold track and drift it. I mean, fly. Barking here and there. And through that big locate was a tree dog. And, and I just fell in love with the blue dog. The way they can drift the track and t- tree layups. I, li- I like the way they tree layups. But your other breeds are just as good. I won't say they're not. I agree. I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the with the buck dogs that you had. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You had screwdriver. I did. I sure did. And, uh-huh. and I had a female out of Buck Two's last litter. Yeah. Yep. And if I remember correctly, that heifer was covered up with Hammer Two. I bought her big papers. She was. And 
she had like 11 crosses of it in there. Yeah. You said that when when old Buck pulled up to the hunt, you knew who was going to win. Just what yeah. kind of hound was he? And tell me a little bit about uh, Bell Creek Blue Buck. Well, I'll tell you about the night uh, I guided him on the George State, uh, and I hunted with him several times after that. Became good friends with Klein Tootle, but on he uh, Klein told me he said, "Son, he said, take me to the biggest pond you got." and pull up on the middle of the pond dam and tell us to send them across the pond. I said, man, I'll look like a fool. And so I did a 50-acre pond. And I pulled up there and I said, send them across this. And they all said, man, no. And Clam said, I'll try it. They cut them loose. The other dogs went around the edge of the pond, but left swimming. Came tree, had first strike and first creep, shut the dogs out. It was like that all night long. He he had stayed tree, I believe, till he died. He was a chop mouth dog. The only thing I did, I could not call him treed. I'd just have to sit there. He treed bark just as much on track as it did tree. Like I say, I'd be at the hunts and be out there with several of the hunters and clown come pulling up. They said, oh, good gracious, here comes the wind. That's that old buck. But then uh, I finally ended up, you know, buying Buck too. Mm -hmm. And he was a good dog. He produced some real good dogs. I had one called Hot Rod out of him that was a good dog. And I, I raised several good ones out of Buck too. Buck too, he was just like the old Buck dog. When you cut them loose, they left flying. I mean, getting up, kicking rock. Yeah, I hunting hunting those dogs for as long as I did that go that went back to them I never understood why people said all you needed was a half an acre and a blue tick and you could hunt all night I know, I know. that's what they used to tell me with Buck too they said you don't need but about five acres to hunt on but when I and when I went to breeding dogs Alan I was still thinking breed good to good Mm -hmm. Then I thought about an old tree and walker dog around here. One of my buddies on Dale Smith, and he was a coon dog. I mean a coon dog. But his pedigree was just, just dogs scattered and didn't know none of them. And they bred female after female to rank and never got a good pet. And then the same man had a dog called Crockett. He was as good as he was. He is a great black dog. And I got him up. Uh, I got a puppy out of him and the best female around the county. And that puppy I had didn't turn out to be nothing. I said, what is wrong? Then I got to thinking about it. I said, they may be the only dog out of the litter that made a good dog. Mm -hmm. You want to look at pedigree and you want, <laughs> you want the majority of the dogs to be good dogs in there and the litter mates. Tell us where where you live. What part of the, uh, what part of the country you live in? Southeast Georgia. Southeast Georgia, a little town called Ambrose. I'm eight miles south of it. Eight miles south of Ambrose. And that yep. would be how many miles west of Douglas, Georgia? Twelve miles to Douglas. And what what kind of terrain did, do you normally hunt in? Beaver ponds. <laughs> <laughs> Beaver Lots ponds of, and gator holes? Yeah, gator holes. Plenty of that, too. One of my favorite hunting spots has got a big gator in it now. I remember when I was going to school at ABAC, or it was after I'd graduated, or it was after I'd left school from ABAC, and I had come back, and they had a hunt at Albany. And it wasn't a winter classic. It was just a just a regular hunt. I went down there, and I do not remember who I drew, but we were hunting in a hard bottom, flat, cypress pond that had a good current through it and the water was clear and it was in february i remember coming up out of that we'd had a good hunt and i don't remember if i was winning but i don't think if i wasn't winning i wasn't getting beat by much we came up out of that flat pond and walked up on the pond dam a man-made pond dam and i looked across through there and there were like 30 sets of eyes and I asked the guide, I said, is that what I think it is? I'm I'm from northeast Georgia, and I had never seen yeah. anything like that before. He said, yep, yeah. that's a pond full of alligators. I said, which way is the truck? <laughs> and 
that was a little bit unnerving. He said, you going to quit? I said, you bet I'm going to quit. I'm going back to North Georgia where we don't have these stinking things. Yeah. That kind of unnerved me a little bit because I know that alligators look at dogs like a, a tree. Yeah. Uh, me and my buddy had a ruby and a, his walker dog treed in a cypress pond one night. In about knee-deep water, he was standing, and I was just standing on the hill shining, and I looked, and here come about an eight-foot gator to him, and I flashed the light, and he seen him and grabbed Ruby and Bo, and he hit the hill. You were talking about your breeding philosophy and breeding good to good, and, and it wasn't working for you. No, no. Tell when me I, when I went, Tell me how you came up with the breeding philosophy that did work for you. Really, the cross of Ruby. Because Sheba, Ruby's mother, was a loud tree dog. Her little mates was was all right. And Buck, his little mates was all right. And Buck was out of Hammer Five. Mm-hmm. I went to checking the female's little mates. Mm-hmm. I had got to the point with the right crosses if they were eight puppies, eight of them had run in tree coons. But that, that was from hand-picking females breeding, too. Mm-hmm. John Falcon, Dave Dean, Ed Willis, those people helped me a lot with the breeding when I was young. Dave Dean, uh, when I bought Buck too, me and him talked just four or five times a week about breeding. He he told me a lot about the line breeding and all. See, back then, people were scared of line breeding. Mm -hmm. And now today, it's, <laughs> that's what you do. It's it's pretty common. Yeah, but John Falcon had a dog called Southern Blue Pride. I guided him on the Georgia State one year, and he was tough. He was out of Hammer Five. So Buck was out of Hammer Five and a, a Pride female. Okay. He was double Hammer Five. But John Falcon loaned me four females. They were reproducers. And they, that's what Hot Rod was out of one of those. And all of those females were out of pride. I think I had a, I did have a female that went back to pride. Yeah, pride was a, he was a ball mouth tree dog, but he he'd stay hooked. Tell me about Mister Ed Willis. Ed Willis was a character. Me and him sat down on my tailgate at the kennel <laughs> thousands of times, probably. And Ed was more of a pleasure hunter, which he won some some hunts. Now don't get me wrong. But he was out there, Ed was out there to help people. Mm -hmm. He uh, he was funny, keep you laughing. He had an old dog called Tag. He was, I think, was out of Marble Hills, dog. He was one of, he was slower on track than I liked. But he'd treat you some coons. And old Ed's gone. He's been gone a while. I remember that. Yeah. The three main people that you'd say were where your mentors would have been Dave Dean, John Falcon, and Mr. Ed Willis. Ed Willis, yeah. Those are three pretty good ones. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell me about some of the dogs that you had over the years and what you liked about them and, and what you did. I've got a couple in mind that I really liked that you had. I like Ruby, of course. I wish you could have hunted with her. She was the loudest tree dog I ever heard. She could tree lay up. You could cut her loose. You pull up to a turnout, and she barked in the box. She was fixing to get tree. I seen her throw her head up and go straight through the woods. Ruby was just just straight natural, and uh, I raised a puppy off of her. She was a natural. Didn't raise but six puppies off of her. Her heat cycle was messed up, but she was all coon dog. That's where the dark blue kennel name came from. And J.J., I've owned so many dogs, and you know that, Alan. J.J., he was the fastest track dog i ever been in the woods with. He could fly. On a cold track, he would fly. Now, you're He's talking about hunting. Moody Creek Blue J.J. Right, Moody Creek Blue J.J. Uh, Joe Moyer trained him from Missouri. Joe was a good trainer. He tried to, at the Winter Classic, he begged me to, to let him take him back to Missouri, he said, I'll qualify him for the world hunt and win it. But I said, no, I'm breeding him. And, and tree laid up. His, his fault, he gnawed, but the time wouldn't catch him. He, he was a good reproducer, too. You could breed him to any female you want to, and uh, I think you could pick up a collie dog, breed to him, and get good touches. I remember.
remember one time you told me that you could take a buck bred female and breed her to a chihuahua and they'd tree. That's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> if you had buck up close, they'd tree. And then the next dog, uh, old Dash, which you remember Dash. Oh, yeah. I really liked him. And, yeah. He, uh, I bought him when he was eight months old from Jack Beals in Colorado. Got him off the airplane. They shipped him into Valdosta, Georgia, at the airport on, on Delta Dash. And I told the boy riding with me on the, home, on the way home, I said, if he's any good, I'm going to name him Dark Blue Delta Dash. We went hunting that night, that same night I got him. He was eight months old, turned him a ruby out. They were driving a track and Dash failed tree. Ruby kept going. I said, well, that that was missed. So Rob Smith went in there to the tree and shot out a big old bull coon. And came back, Ruby had tree. She had another one, a sow coon. They were mating, I think. Dash, he he was quick and, and a layup artist. I mean, he could lay a coon up. He was Uchman bred. Had a, he had a quarter of Southern Blue Pride in him. Mm-hmm. But his daddy, the sire to him, Coy Williams, in Tennessee on him. And then I finally bought the mother to Dash, uh, Daisy. She was out of Harper Fripp, Joe. Yeah. Uh, he I, was a uh, producer. Oh, I remember Dash well. I, one night I was hunting with him and he treed in a, broke off snag in the middle of a clear cut it wasn't it wasn't even grown up yeah and i was wondering what in the world was going on and i go over there and the snag was hollow and there was about three kitten coons in there three or four <laughs> you know not probably big as your fist yeah and i was like well that'll be all right <laughs> oh yeah he can do lay them up and he was a fast dog. He didn't bark twice in the same place. Coonhunting University is brought to you by Superior Light Company. Use coupon code CHUPODCAST at checkout at nighthunters.com. If you're in the market for a new light, do not overlook Superior. They make the best light in the business. The Hellcat Max Flat Dark Earth Edition is awesome. Comes standard with the new and improved high-intensity green laser Come standard with the newest design and dual walking light modules, offering the brightest walking lights currently available on the market, bar none. And it comes with your choice of red or true amber or double red color module technology. The Hellcat Max new module design reduces weight without sacrificing burn time or brightness, resulting in an overall weight of just 20 to 24 ounces, depending on your cap selection. The Hellcat Max offers the newest battery technology, which allows for five hours of continuous main beam burn time on the highest setting and over 10 hours of highest auxiliary light settings. All controls can be found on one easy nine positions click switch. And all superior lights come with a two-year warranty or are made right here in the USA. So check out superior lights. Use coupon code CHUPODCAST at checkout at nighthunters.com. Thank you to Mr. Jamie, Mr. Sam at superior lights for supporting Coonhunting University Podcast and making this podcast possible. So I ask all the listeners, if you could, please go over there and support Superior Light. Use the exclusive discount code that is only available to Coonhunting University Podcast listeners, CHU Podcast. Superior, step up to the max. Now, back to the show. And uh, if dogs crowded him, uh, we were hunting one night on a competition hunt and drew out with a, a guy that, had a walker dog. We, I was guiding. We got out and he said, well, boys, y'all fixing to hunt with the best coon dog y'all have ever been with. And he asked the guy, said, how's your English dog? He said, she's pretty good. He said, what about that other walker dog? Said, pretty good. He said, what about that old blue dog? I said, he ain't a bit of good. Turned out, got first strike. They were running that coon. Dash hushed his mouth. Man said, uh, well, I hear the English dog and the two walker dogs said we must be through the blue dog out of the race. I said, yeah, he did. He hushed, he hushed his mouth and got up on that coon and treed three 
300 yards ahead of them. And that, that man said, I don't believe this. We turned out again, and he done it again. He said, you can't beat this blue dog. I said, and he ain't no good. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't no good. <laughs> no. Well, I had a I had a puppy off a of dash that would but that would do the same exact thing. If they got up on him, he'd hush. And if they kept pushing him hard, he wouldn't even locate before he treed. Yeah, yeah. Dash would always do that old big long ball locate. Mm-hmm. Another one that that well, one of my favorite dogs of all time would have been Dash's sister Beth. Yeah, yeah. Beth was a good dog. Barry bought her from the same guy. Jack Peels in Colorado, very damn poor deal. Mm-hmm. I got her when she was older, and she died at my place. But man, yeah. she could treat coons. Yes, yeah, she could treat coons. That's why Dash. Uh, now you had you had crossing Dash. You remember we had the outcrossing. Yep. You had the crossing on something besides Ooch and blood, uh, and then screwdriver. We found out too late. That he should have been bred to the Oopsman dog. That's right. <laughs> That's right. We we were trying to breed him the same way we bred his daddy, and it did yeah, not work. Yeah, yeah. It just genetics is something else. But every time we bred him to an Oopsman bred dog, we had something pretty cool. Yeah. I did breed him to Beth the last litter she had. I bred yeah. a screwdriver to Beth, and those were some nice dogs. They they turned out really really good. Um, I bet. I got them scattered all over. And, yeah. of course, that's been so long ago now that I I couldn't remember who had them and who didn't. That they'd all be right. dead dead from old age now anyway. Yeah, yeah. But that worked. So we bred, yeah. you know, and then there was another dog, I think, came from it that was bred to, uh, he was bred to a Homer, McGinnis Blue Homer 2 female. And Tony Poole had that dog, I think. Yeah, Ruger. I think at one time he was the youngest quadruple grand champion in UKC history. I sold him that puppy. And he was a producer. Yeah, he was. I don't know. If I, if, if I could have, when I started back hunting in 2010, could have picked up right off with the dogs that I left off with. Yeah. I probably would still be hunting blue ticks. Right. Well, like I told you, if I hunted another breed, it would be English. I've always liked the English stuff. There are good ones in all all breeds, and uh, there are a lot of bad ones in all breeds. There is that. And if you're a breeder, you have produced bad ones. You may not yeah. have produced any good ones, but I can promise you, you have produced bad ones if you if you yeah, breed I've dogs. Produced a, I've produced a lot of bad ones and, 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 and a good many good ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, over 50 years you and know what you're doing, you're bound to produce something that's pretty good. Well, I've enjoyed it, Alan. I've, I've, I met a lot of friends on the road with the dogs. I hated to give it up, but my health just got the best of me. Mm-hmm. Had two, two heart attacks one week. Uh, it just it took something out of me. I don't know if the listeners know, but you're 62 years old. You've had two heart attacks, and you were lucky to make 20. Oh, I, uh, when I was 11 years old in 1971, they diagnosed me with bone cancer and uh, said I had from six months to a year to live and said I wouldn't, wouldn't live past 21, but we got a higher power. Yes, sir. And that's what my doctor told me, but I made it through it. I was raised in a Christian family, had a good mother and daddy. It's hard to follow in, in my daddy's uh, footsteps, but I try. And I only got one foot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no, I really enjoyed it. It's been a blast. It just it came to an end, and it hurt me to see my dogs go. I would imagine it would. I remember, I remember the day that it, I walked back there to the kennel, and I saw screwdriver laying in the kennel dead and yep. I cried like a baby. Yep. Yep. And that was and I I've I've been really blessed with with these coon dogs. Uh, but screwdriver yep. his name was Dark Blue Screaming Screwdriver. And he right. 
was the first once in a lifetime hound I ever owned. Yeah. And I've been fortunate to have some that that were just as good or better even. Uh but he's always yeah. been the measuring stick. Right. For me. I hear you. Yeah. Uh the coat dog I had, K and W uh Midnight Blue Coat Dual Grand. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he uh he was a good dog. And I I bought his sister, Valerie. She was a grand knight. Ronald Kite trained them. They minded like a child. Better than a child. <laughs> they could be treated across the river or something. You could holler and they'd come to you. That sure is nice. Yeah, it is. Yeah. He was a good dog. He was real good in water. How was he bred, Steve? Stan Wagner bred that dog up there. He went back to some Oochman dogs a lot. Mm-hmm. And I can't even think. The, the daddy to him was a dog called Jammer. Moody Creek Blue Jammer, I think. And that would have been J.J.'s sire, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Colt and Valerie both were uh, grandsons, grandson and granddaughter to J.J. Okay. Yeah. And, that, and I got the hearing about Colt, so I bought half of him from Ronald. He ended up somewhere up there around uh, by Rob Seedling. Mm-hmm. And I think he just died. How old would he have been, just roughly? Oh, Lord. Probably 12 years old. Ruby was 13 when she died. Mm-hmm. J.J. was 10. Oh, I had the dog, the banging blue cat dog. He was a coon dog. He was Diamond Jim bred. I've had so many dogs, Alan. <laughs> Just for posterity, I guess, and you don't have to give me an exact answer. All the years that you bred blue ticks, how many puppies do you think you, you whelped out? <laughs> Lord, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Seemed like Dash had seven hundred something puppies. <laughs> JJ had seven hundred something. Then my Albert three dog that I had. He look, there's no ten thousands of puppies. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking a big thousand, but a lot of uh, yeah, but, uh, well over a thousand. I know that. But Dash they about produced that. In southeast Georgia, where did a lot of those puppies go? Most of my puppies went to pleasure hunters, I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't care. I could have placed the puppies with the right people and had, you know, all kind of titles. But they just, and they went up north. I sold a lot of them up north. I know I know. I sold some when I when I was fooling with them. I sold some out west for, for big game dogs. I sold quite a few for bear dogs. I, I sold... Uh, a guy, I believe it was Montana. That's what he done, big game. And the first pet I ever shipped, I shipped him to Washington State. Sent one to China. I bet that was an uh, adventure. Yeah, yeah. The guy uh, said he made a good dog. They, they were hunting something. It looked like a coon with a long tail. But he, he said he made a good dog. Well, this is your stage, and you get to say whatever you want to say, so... I want to thank everybody uh, for supporting me. The ones that bought puppies, bred females all over the years, I thank you for that. And and I definitely thank everybody for praying for me when I was had the heart attack. I've had a ball, Alan. I've, I've, but it's come to an end. <laughs> yeah. Good. All good things must end, they say. That's right. But, you know, for my part, I appreciate everything you taught me about the dogs i give you know whether whether it's it's credit or blame i give it to you for teaching me most of what i know about breeding hounds even from a a teenager to almost a middle-aged man now yeah trick is you you've got to make the cross and if it works Stick stick with it and if it doesn't work don't do it again that's right it's been my experience that if it's a first time cross, you just cross your fingers and hope for the best. That's right. You know, you taught me that it was it was okay 
to line breed these dogs. And even though I'm not hunting blue ticks anymore, those principles still apply to to the dogs right. that, that I hunt today. And right. and you know you are a big reason why that if I have had any success, your I guess your mentorship for me has has certainly helped. Thank you for that. Thank you. I was kind of awestruck when you called me up and said, "Hey, you got a dog that's got uh, it's got a dark blue <laughs> name on him." And, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I just named him that because that was his that was his pedigree. <laughs> And yeah. and I really liked it, and you know, yeah, and and so it's funny how how things work out. You know, I tell people all the time that we do it because we love the dogs, but this deal we're in with the with with these hounds, it's a it's a people business, and yeah. and you yeah. get to meet people. Obviously, we have from time to time some characters that that make it tougher on everybody, but yeah. but uh, by and large, I've met great great people and oh yes yeah. and so i i tell everybody when when they ask me you know questions about breeding dogs and i said well have you ever heard of a guy named dave dean well yeah <laughs> i said i kind of breed dogs the way he did a little bit you yeah. knew dave i never spoke to him but i know a guy that dave taught how to breed dogs to <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he taught he sure me did. He sure helped me a lot. I really appreciate you agreeing to do this, Steve, and it's been a pleasure. And to maybe one day get you back on here and okay. talk about Blue Tick some more. All right. And I've enjoyed it, Adeline. It's been my pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We are proud to have Conkey's Outdoors as a sponsor of CHU Podcast. Conkey's is your complete hunting and hound supply store. They carry brands like Garmin, Daltra, Dan's, and even Summit Tree Stands and much, much more. Whether you're in the market for a new thermal or a new hunting rifle, Conkey's has it all. They even offer financing options. Being a family run business with customer service that is second to none, it's no wonder why Conkey's is the best in the business. So go check them out at conkeysoutdoors.com or find them on Facebook at Conkey's Outdoors. I really hope y'all enjoyed that interview as much as I did. If you like what you heard here, go on over to Facebook. Give us a like, at Coon Hunting U. Also, go to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us out. And remember, if you need a new hunting light, do not overlook Superior. They make an awesome light, best customer service in the business. Man, their walking light and double red is the brightest I've ever seen. Use coupon code CHU Podcast at checkout at nighthunters.com. You can find the link in the description box below this. Coon Hunting University is a product of Audio Hound Productions. Until next time, y'all have a wonderful day.